Great Expectations by Charles Dickens, Episode 3. Pip has been informed by a London lawyer, Mr. Jaggers, that he has a mysterious benefactor who wishes him to go to London and be educated as a gentleman. Pip is certain that his benefactor must be Miss Havisham and sets off for London full of hope for his bright future. We Britons thought at that time we had the best and were the best of everything. Otherwise, while I was scared by the immensity of London, I think at first sight I might have had some faint doubts whether it was not rather ugly, crooked, narrow and dirty. My new guardian, Mr Jaggers, had duly sent me his address, Little Britain, just out of Smithfield and close to the coach office. I had scarcely time to enjoy the hackney coach and think how like a straw yard it was and to wonder why the horse's nose bags were kept inside. Here's we are, sir. Mr. Jagger's office. How much? A shilling. Unless you wish to make it more. I think not. Then it must be a shilling. I don't want to get into trouble with Mr. Jagger's. I know him. Thank you, sir. I went into the front office, my little portmanteau in my hand. Mr. Jaggers being in court, I was directed to wait in his room. It was lighted by a skylight only, and was a most dismal place... There were not so many papers about, but there were some odd objects. A rusty old pistol, a sword in a scabbard, and two dreadful casts on a shelf of faces peculiarly swollen and twitchy about the nose. Mr. Jagger's own high-backed chair was of deadly black horsehair with rows of brass nails around it like a coffin. The room, being small, the clients would seem to have had the habit of backing up against the wall opposite, it being greasy with shoulders. I sat wondering and waiting in the close place until I could no longer bear the two faces above Mr. Jagger's chair and got up and went out to take a turn in the air. Thus I discovered Smithfield, a shameful place all a smear with filth and fat and foam and blood and the black dome of St. Paul's and Newgate Prison. Following the wall of the jail, I found the roadway covered with straw to deaden the noise of passing vehicles, and from this and the quantity of people standing about smelling strongly of spirits and beer, I inferred that the trials were on. Step inside, sir. Hear a trial or so. I can arrange, sir, a front place for half a crown. No, no, thank you. Full view of the Lord Chief Justice in his wig and robe, sir. I, I, I have to be elsewhere. All right, sir. Eighteen pence will show you where the gallows are kept. The whipping yard, the debtor's door, eighteen pence, sir. And the portal from whence today, four of them will come out to be killed in a row. No, uh, no, no, thank you. At length, I refound Little Britain, where I became aware I was not the only one waiting for Jaggers. Jaggers will do it if it's to be done. Jaggers is for him, Amelia. What more could you have? Oh, 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 here it comes. Ah, Mr. Pip. Oh, uh, Mr. Jaggers. Uh, excuse me a moment. Mr. Jaggers. I have nothing to say to you. I want to know no more than I know. As for the result, it's a toss-up. Have you paid Wemmick? We made the money up this morning, sir. Has Wemmick got it? Oh, yes, sir. Then you may go. Now, you. Ah, um, Amelia, isn't it? Yes, Mr. Jaggers. And do you remember that but for me you wouldn't be here and couldn't be here? Oh, yes, sir. Lord bless you, sir. Well, we know that. Then why do you come here? 
<laughs> My bill, sir. Now, I'll tell you what, once and for all, if you don't know that your bill is in good hands, I know it. And if you come here bothering me about your bill again, I shall make an example of both your bill and you and let him slip through my fingers. Oh, no, sir. Have you paid Wemmick? Oh, oh yes, sir. Every farthing. Then you've done all you have got to do. Oh, but, sir, I... <laughs> Say another word, one single word, and Wemmick shall give you your money back. Oh, no, sir. Now, out of our way. While he lunched, standing from a sandwich box and a pocket flask of sherry, he seemed to bully his very sandwich as he ate it. I was informed what arrangements he had made for me. Now, you will go to Barnard's Inn. Barnard's Inn. As I say, one of the ancient inns of Chancery, now having no legal character whatsoever. To the rooms of young Mr. Pocket. A bed has been sent in for your accommodation. You will remain with young Pocket until Monday. On Monday, you will go with him to visit his father, Mr. Matthew Pocket, by whatever means convenient to you, and uh, try how you like him. Yes. Your allowance is a very liberal one. There are the cards of certain traders whom you'll deal with for all kinds of clothes and such other items you can reasonably want. Thank you. I'm not here to be thanked. What I do, I do because I'm paid to do it, no more. You will find your credit good, Mr. Pip, but I shall, by this means, be able to check your bills and pull you up if I find you outrunning the constable. Of course, you'll go wrong somehow, but that's no fault of mine. Wemmick will walk you round to your rooms. Good day. Oh, Mr. Oh, Mr. I tell you, it's Mr. no Wemmick. use. He won't have a word to say to one of you. Oh, Mr. Wemmick, please. I found Mr. Wemmick to be a dry man, short, with a square wooden face. Several rings and seals hung from his watch chain. He wore four morning rings, and he had keen, black, glittering, fifty-year-old eyes. So, you were never in London before? No. I was new here once. Rum to think of it now. But now I know the moves of it. Is it a very uh, wicked place? You may get cheated, robbed and murdered in London. But there are plenty of people anywhere who'll do that for you. If there is bad blood between you and them? Oh, I don't know. They'll do it if there's anything to be got by it. He had a post-box mouth that gave a mechanical appearance of smiling. We had got to the top of Hoban Hill before I knew it was merely a mechanical appearance and that he was not smiling at all. Do you know where Mr Matthew Pocket lives? Hammersmith, west of London. Is that far? Well, say, five miles. Do you know him? Why, you're a regular cross-examiner. Yes, I know him. I know him. Ah, here we are. Barnard's Inn. To let, to let, to let glared at me from empty rooms around the square that looked to me like a flat burying ground scavenged by dismal cats, dismal sparrows, and all shrouded in a frowsy pall of soot and smoke. Ah, the retirement reminds you of the country? So it does me. <sighs> Return shortly. Hmm. Mr. Pocket Jr. hardly thought you'd come so soon. You don't want me any more? Uh, no, th thank you. As I keep the cash, we shall most likely meet pretty often. Uh, good day. <coughs> good day. Eh? Oh, to be sure. <laughs> You're in the habit of shaking hands? Is it not the London fashion? I've got so out of it. Very glad, I'm sure, <laughs> to make you your acquaintance. Yes. Uh, good day. Mr. Pocket Jr.'s idea of shortly was not mine, for I had nearly maddened myself looking out of the windows in crusted dirt for nearly half an hour before... Mr. Pip? Mr. Pocket? I'm extremely sorry, but the fact is I've been out on your account. Not that it's any excuse. For I thought, coming from the country, you might like a little fruit after dinner. 
so I went to Covent Garden Market to get it fresh. <coughs> Dear me, this door. Let me. As he was fast <coughs> making jam of the fruit while wrestling with the door. Please, take the baskets. <coughs> Please, come in. I'm rather bare here, but Father thought you'd get more agreeably through tomorrow with me than him. No, I'm sure. I'm sure I'll be very happy to show London to you. Now, the table. Uh, you won't find that bad, I hope. It'll be supplied from the coffee house here, and it's only right I should add at your expense, such being Mr. Jagger's instructions. So, well, that, that... I, I know it's not splendid, because I have my own bread to earn, and my father hasn't anything to give me, and I shouldn't be willing to take it even if he had. Uh, this is your bedroom. If you want anything, I'll go and get it. The chambers are retired, and we shall be close together, but we shan't fight, I dare say. Oh, uh, you're holding the fruit still. Uh, let me take... Oh. You're the prowling boy from Miss Havisham's. And you're the pale young gentleman. <laughs> you! you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all over now, I hope. Yes! And it will be generous of you if you'll forgive me for having knocked you about so. Of course. You hadn't come into your good fortune at that time. No. No. I was rather on the lookout for good fortune then. Miss Havisham had sent for me, trial visit. And if I'd come out of it successfully, I suppose I would have been provided for. I'd have been what you call it to a Stella. What's that? Affianced, uh, betrothed, engaged. Uh, what's its name? Any word of that sort. How did you bear your disappointment? Oh, she's a tartar. Miss Havisham? A Stella. She's hard and haughty and we've been brought up by Miss Havisham to wreak revenge on all the male sex. What relation is she? None. Only adopted. Sit down, I beg you. Sit down. Why should she wreak revenge on all the male sex? What revenge? Lord, Mr Pip, don't you know? No. Then we'll keep it till dinner. Through him being Miss Havisham's man of business, Mr Jaggers was good enough to suggest my father for your tutor. My father is Miss Havisham's cousin but he's a bad courtier and won't flatter her. I had never seen anyone then, nor anyone since, who more strongly expressed to me, in every look and tone, a natural incapacity to do anything secret or mean than Herbert Pocket. There, dinner. What do you think? Perfect. I would take it as a great kindness, Mr Pocket, if you would give me a hint whenever you see me at a loss or going wrong. With pleasure. But in return, you must do me the favour of calling me by my Christian name, Herbert. With pleasure. And I'm Philip. I don't take to Philip. It sounds like a moral boy in a book, so determined to go a bird's nesting that he got himself eaten by bears who lived handily in the neighbourhood. <laughs> i tell you what I should like. We are so harmonious, and you have been a blacksmith. Would you mind Handel for a familiar name? I don't understand. There's a charming piece of music by Handel called The Harmonious Blacksmith. Oh, I should like it very much. Then eat, my dear Handel. Eat. <clears throat> you promised to tell me about Miss Havisham. Mm. Just allow me to mention, Handel, that in London it is not the custom to put the knife in the mouth for fear of accidents. And while the fork is reserved for that use... It is not put further in than necessary. It's scarcely worth mentioning, only it's as well to do as other folk do. Also, the spoon is not generally used overhand, but under. This has two advantages. You get at your mouth better, which, after all, is the object, and you save a good deal of the attitude of opening oysters on the part of the right elbow. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Havisham. Her mother died early, and she's the spoilt child of a rich, rich brewer who denied her nothing. He was very proud, and so is she. She was the only child. No, her father privately married again. His cook, I rather think. Mm. She died, and their son became part of the family, but riotous, dear Handel, extravagant, undutiful, bad. The father, though, on his death, left him well off, but not so well off as Miss Havisham. Uh, excuse my mentioning that society as a body does not expect one to be so strictly conscientious in emptying one's glass as to turn it bottom upwards with the rim on one's nose. Thank you. Not at all. The half-brother soon ran up awful debts, and he seemed to bear a deep moral grudge against his sister. And now I come to the cruel part of the story. Merely breaking off, my dear Handel, to remark that a dinner napkin will not go into a tumbler. Thank you. Not at all, I'm sure. 
There now appeared on the scene, at the races, a certain man who made love to Miss Havisham. This happened five and twenty years ago. A showy man, not a gentleman. No varnish can hide the grain of the wood, as my father would say. She passionately loved him, and in a systematic way he got great sums of money from her. He induced her to buy her brother out of his share of the brewery, on the plea that when he was her husband, he must hold and manage it all. She would listen to no advice. Only my father warned her that she was doing too much for the man, and she ordered him out of the house, and he's never seen her since. Matthew Pocket will come and see me at last when I am on this table. His place will be at my head. The marriage day was fixed, the wedding dresses were bought, the wedding tour was planned, the wedding guests invited. The day came, but not the bridegroom. He wrote her a letter. Which she received when she was dressing for her wedding, at twenty to nine. The hour and the minute. <sighs> at which she afterwards stopped all the clocks. Uh, what was in the letter, I can't tell. But when she recovered from a bad illness, she laid the whole place waste, as you have seen it. And she's never since looked upon the light of day. Ah, uh, I've forgotten one thing. It has been supposed that the man to whom she gave her misplaced confidence acted throughout in concert with the half-brother. That the whole thing was a conspiracy between them and that they shared the money. I wonder he didn't marry her and get all the property. He may have been married already. And her cruel mortification may have been a part of the half-brother's scheme. Are they alive now? I don't know. You said just now that Estella was not related to Miss Havisham, but adopted. That when adopted? There has always been an Estella, since I've heard of a Miss Havisham. I know no more. So now, my dear Handel, all that I know about Miss Havisham, you know. So let us walk. Walk in the streets, go half price to the theatre, and tomorrow to church at Westminster Abbey. What are you, Herbert? A capitalist, an insurer of ships, in a counting house here in the city. Uh, I shan't be satisfied with insurance. I shall also do a little in the mining way, or I'll charter a few thousand tons on my own account. I think I shall trade to the East Indies for silk, shawls, spices, dyes, drugs and precious woods. It's an interesting trade. And the profits are large. Tremendous. You want a good many ships. A perfect fleet. Where do the ships you insure mostly trade to at present? I haven't begun yet. I'm looking about me. Is a counting house profitable? Do you mean to the young fellow who's in it? Yes. No, not, not directly. That is, it doesn't pay me anything, and I have to um, keep myself. But the thing is that you look about you. That's the grand thing. You're in a counting house, you know, and you look about you. Then, when the time comes... You see your opening, and you go in, and you swoop upon it, and you make your capital, and then there you are. When you've once made your capital, you have nothing to do but employ it. <laughs> After church next day, we walked in the parks, and I wondered who shot all the horses there, and wished Joe did. On that Sunday, a single day since I had left Joe and Biddy, it seemed months and our marshes were any distance away. Yet in the London streets, so crowded with people and so brilliantly lighted in the dusk of evening, there were depressing hints of reproaches for the fact that I had put the poor old kitchen at home already so far away. The next day, after Herbert had reported to his counting house, to look about him, I suppose, not at all in my eyes a good observatory, being a back, second floor, upper yard, we took the coach for Hammersmith, thence into a little garden overlooking the river where Mr Matthew Pocket's children seemed to be not growing up or being brought up, but tumbling up. Mama, this is young Mr Pip. Oh, Master Alec and Miss Jane. If you go bounding up against them bushes, you'll fall over into the river and be drowned. And what'll your pa say then? It's your handkerchief, Mum. Oh. If it isn't the sixth time you've dropped it. <laughs> Thank you, Flopson. Leave me my book. Mama, 
This is Mr. Pip. Oh, I hope your mother is quite well. Uh, well, Mum, if I have one. Well, that doesn't make seven times. What are you doing of this afternoon, Mum? <laughs> Thank you, Flopson. I found, now that I had leisure to count them, that there were no fewer than six little pockets present in various stages of tumbling. Seven. Oh, if that ain't baby. My father won't be long. I thus had an opportunity of observing a remarkable family phenomenon. Whenever any of the children strayed near Mrs. Pocket in their play, they always tripped themselves up and tumbled over. <laughs> then Flopson, in the act of handing the baby over to Mrs. Pocket, also went fairly head first over Mrs. Pocket, baby and all. <laughs> to be neatly caught by Herbert and myself. Oh, gracious me, Flopson! <laughs> Everybody's tumbling! Why, Mum, if it ain't your footstool! If you keep it under your skirts like that, who's to help tumbling? Take them all in for their naps, Flotton. <laughs> Thus, I made my second discovery on this first occasion, that the nurture of the little pockets consisted of alternating tumbling up and lying down. My mother, dear Handel, was brought up as one who, in the nature of things, must marry a title. So she has, I'm afraid, no domestic knowledge. Nor has my father. I'm very glad to see you, Mr. Pip, and I hope you're not sorry to see me, <laughs> for I'm really not an alarming personage. He was a young looking man with very grey hair disordered on his head, as if he didn't quite see his way to putting anything straight. Come and see your room. It's fine. Very pleasant. <laughs> and in here. Your fellow students, Mr. Drummle and Mr. Startop, uh, at present absent. Both Mr. and Mrs. Pocket had such a noticeable air of being in somebody else's hands that I wondered who really was in possession of the house. But before I'd been there a week, I knew. The servants allowed a very liberal table to their employers, but they felt it a duty they owed to themselves to be nice in their eating and drinking too. This is a pretty thing, Belinda. The cook is lying insensibly drunk on the kitchen floor. Oh, it's that odious Sophia's doing. What do you mean? She was whispering in your ear not a minute ago. Did she not take me downstairs, Belinda, and show me the woman? Oh, do you defend her, Matthew, for making mischief? <sighs> Am I? Grandpapa's granddaughter to be nothing in this house? Uh. Besides, the cook has always been a very nice, respectful person, and she said in the most natural manner when she came to look after the situation that she felt I was bound to be a duchess. <laughs> Good night, Mr. Pip. You are established and happy here, Mr. Pip? Oh, yes. <laughs> Your career. I've been informed by Mr. Jaggers that you are not aimed for any profession. You will be well enough educated for your destiny if you can hold your own with the average of young men in the same prosperous circumstances. So, what I propose is you attend certain places in London for the acquisition of whatever rudiments you need. Then, if you need any explanations, come to me. And gradually, you'll be able to dispense with any help but mine. Uh, agreed? Indeed, thank you. Uh, so, may I seek your immediate help on one point? Oh, indeed, indeed. If I could retain my bedroom in Barnard's Inn, I could learn here and in London. Indeed. My manners will never be the worse for Herbert's company and society. I cannot object. But I urge you... Before you take any step, submit it to your guardian, please. I felt that his delicacy arose out of a consideration that the plan would save her but some expense. Naturally, I agreed. <laughs> well, do it. How much do you want? Fifty pounds? Oh, not nearly so much. Oh, five pounds. Um, more than that? How much more? Oh, that's so difficult to fix a sum. Well, twice five, thrice five, will uh, that do you? Four times five. Uh, yes, handsomely. Now, what do you make of four times five? I suppose you make it 20 pounds. Never mind what I make it, my friend. I want to know what you make it. Uh, tw 20 pounds, of course. Wemmick, take Mr. Pitt's written order and pay him 20 pounds. Good day, sir.
and in his great, bright, creaking black boots he'd gone. I hardly know what I make of Mr. Jagger's manner. Mm, you tell him that, and he'll take it as a compliment. You don't mean that you should know what to make of it. That's not personal. It's professional. Only professional. Wemmick was lunging on a dry, hard biscuit, pieces of which he threw from time to time into his slit of a mouth as if he were posting them. I suppose he's very skilful in court. Deep as Australia. If there was anything deeper, he'd be it. He must have a fine business. Capital. Now, I'll pay you direct, Mr Pip, and then show you round the place. This, his room, you've seen already. Those two casts up there, whose likenesses are they? These? Yes. They're two celebrated ones. Famous clients that got us a world of credit. <clears throat> this chap murdered his master, and considering that he wasn't brought up to evidence, didn't plan it badly. Uh, you need a rub. Is it like him? Oh, it's himself. The cast was made in Newgate directly after he was taken down. You had a particular fancy for me, hadn't you, old artful? See this brooch? The lady, weeping willow, tomb with the urn on it. Yet it made for me express. Is the lady anybody? No, only his game. And that other one has the same look. Oh, you're right. It's the genuine look. Much as if... One nostril was caught up in a little fish hook. He forged wills, this blade did, before putting the poor testators to sleep. I never met such a beautiful liar. This morning, ring, sent out to buy it for me, only the day before. Are all your rings gifts? Yes. Yeah. One brings the other, you see, that's the way of it. I always take them. They may not be worth much, but after all, they're property and portable. It doesn't signify to you with your brilliant lookout, but as to myself, my guiding star always is get hold of portable property. If any odd time when you're nothing to do, you wouldn't mind coming over to see me at Woolworth, I could offer you a bed and I should consider it an honour. I've not much to show you, but such two or three curiosities as I have got, you might like to look over. And I'm fond of a bit of garden and a summer house. I'd be delighted. Thank you. Then we'll consider it that it's to come off when convenient to you. Have you dined with Mr Jaggers yet? No, not, not yet. Well, he'll give you wine and good wine. I'll give you punch and not bad punch. And now I'll tell you something. When you go to dine with Mr. Jaggers, look at his housekeeper. Shall I see something very uncommon? You'll see a wild beast tamed. Not so very uncommon, you'll tell me. I reply that depends on the original wildness of the beast and the amount of taming. It won't lower your opinion of Mr. Jaggers' powers. Keep your eye on it. Although I soon contracted expensive habits, I even bought a boat and presented a half share in it to Herbert. I stuck to my books. There was no other merit in this than my having sense enough to know my deficiencies. And between Mr Pocket and Herbert, I got on fast. I had not seen Mr Wemmick for some weeks, so I thought I'd write to him proposing a trip to his home one evening. He replied it would give him much pleasure and that he'd expect me at the office at six o'clock. And there I found him, putting the key of the safe down his back as the clock struck. Do you mind walking to Woolworth? Not at all, if you approve. Very much. I've had my legs under the desk all day and shall be glad to stretch them. And I've got a cold roast fowl, which is from the cook's shop. 
I think it's tender because the master of the shop was a juryman in some cases of ours the other day, and we let him down easy. He said, let me make you a present of the best fowl in the shop. I let him, of course. As far as it goes, it's property and portable. You don't object to an aged parent, I hope? The fowl? I have an aged parent at my place. Oh. <laughs> so, you haven't dined with Mr. Jaggers yet? No. I expect you'll hear tomorrow. He's going to ask your pals, too. Three of them, are there? Yes. Hmm. Whatever he gives you, he'll give you good. Don't look forward to variety, but you'll have excellence. Wemmick's house was a little wooden cottage in the midst of plots of gardens, and the top of it was cut out and painted like a battery mounted with guns. My own doing. Looks pretty, don't it? Beautiful. Now that's a real flagstaff, and on Sundays I run up a real flag. Then, look here, after I've crossed the bridge, I hoist it up. And... Ah. Yeah. So, and cut off the communications. The bridge was a plank, and we'd crossed a chasm about four feet wide and two feet deep. At nine o'clock every night, Greenwich time, the gun fires. There he is, you see. And when you hear him go, I think you'll say he's a stinger. It's a principle with me. If you have an idea, carry it out and keep it up. I don't know whether that's your opinion. Oh, yes. At the back, there's a pig, some fowls, rabbits, cucumbers. <laughs> you'll judge at supper what sort of salad I can raise. So, sir, if you can suppose the little place besieged, it would hold out a devil of a time in point of provisions. I'm my own jack-of-all-trades. It's a good thing, you know. It brushes the Newgate cobwebs away and pleases the aged. It, it wouldn't put you out being introduced. Oh, please. By the fire sat a very old man in a flannel coat. Clean, cheerful, comfortable, well cared for, and intensely deaf. Well, aged parent, how are you? All right, John, all right. Here's Mr Pip, aged parent. Uh and I wish you could hear his name. Uh, nod at him, Mr Pip. That's what he likes. Nod away at him. This is a fine place of my son, sir. This is a pretty pleasure ground, sir. This spot and these beautiful works upon it ought to be kept together by the nation after my son's time for the people's enjoyment. Uh, before we partake, Mr Pip, if you're not too tired, will you tip him one more? Oh, ho, ho. there's a tremendous one. You can't think how it pleases him. I hope Mr Jaggers admires your home. Never seen it, never heard of it, or met the aged, no. The office is one thing and private life is another. When I go into the office, I leave the castle behind me, and when I come into the castle, I leave the office behind me. If it's not in the way disagreeable to you, Mr. Pip, you'll oblige me by doing the same. Well, I don't wish it professionally spoken about. Ah, it's getting near gunfire. It's the aged's treat. Proceeding back into the castle from the arbour again, we found the aged heating the poker with expectant eyes. At a precise moment, Wemmick took the instrument, repaired to the battery, and presently the stinger went off with a bang. <laughs> It shook the crazy little box of a cottage as if it must fall to pieces. He's fired! I heard him! The supper was excellent, and though the pig outside might have been further off, I was heartily pleased with my whole entertainment. Next morning, at half-past eight precisely, we started for Little Britain. By degrees, Wemmick got drier and harder as we went along, and his mouth tightened into a postbox again. Dinner, Mr. Pip. No ceremony and no dinner dress, and say tomorrow. Thank you. Where should we come to? Here, and I'll take you home with me. In a stately house, dolefully in want of painting and with dirty windows in Gerard Street, Soho, we clambered by a dark brown staircase to a book-lined dining room. I hold the whole house, but rarely use more of it than you see. Everything was official, solid, unornamental. In a corner was a little table of papers, 
so that he seemed to bring the office home with him. <laughs> Pip, I don't know one from the other. Who's the spider? The spider? Yes, the blotchy, sprawly, sulky fellow. <laughs> Bentley Drummle. The one with the delicate face is Startop. Bentley Drummle. I like the look of that fellow. Uh, Mr. Drummle, sir. <laughs> then the housekeeper came in with the first dish for dinner. Look at his housekeeper. You'll see a wild beast tamed. Keep your eye on it. She was a woman of about 40, tall, of nimble, lithe figure, extremely pale, with large, faded eyes and a quantity of streaming hair. I cannot say whether any diseased affection of the heart caused her lips to be parted as if she were panting. Now, at half past nine, gentlemen, we must break up. Please make the best use of your time. I'm glad to see you all. Mr. Drummle, I drink to you. Oh, Mr. Drummle. Whenever she was in the room, she kept her eyes attentively on my guardian, and she'd remove her hands from any dish she'd put before him, hesitatingly as if she dreaded him calling her back. And I fancied, in Mr. Jagger's manner, an awareness of this, and a purpose of always holding her in suspense. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it was when we had got to the cheese that the conversation turned to our rowing. No, no, <laughs> None is stronger than Startop. Startop? Startop <laughs> keeps up with Mr. Pitt, Mr. Jaggers. <laughs> They're like two racing swans. <laughs> While dear Bentley here creeps along in shore <laughs> like some amphibious creature. I'm, I'm more than their master. Amphibious? <laughs> In its strength, you need. Oh. Oh, I could shatter these, these women like chaff. Oh. Now, look at these muscles. Look, look. Can you even find your arm, Startup? <laughs> if you talk of strength, I'll show you a wrist. Uh, oh, now, Molly, let them see your wrist. Master, don't. Master, please. Let them see both your wrists. Show them. Come. He released her hand. She brought her other from behind her and held the two out side by side. The last was most disfigured, deeply scarred and a cross and a cross. She took her eyes from Mr. Jaggers and turned them on every one of us in succession. There's power here. Very few men have the power of wrist this woman has. It's remarkable what mere force of grip there is in these hands. I've had occasion to notice many hands, but I never saw stronger in that respect, Mr. Drummle. Man's or woman's. That'll do, Molly. You've been admired. You can go. Mr. Jaggers, I'm sorry if we were at all disagreeable. Oh, it's nothing, Pip. I like that spider, though. I'm glad you do, sir. But I don't. No. No, don't have too much to do with him. Keep as clear of him as you can. But I like the fellow, Pip. He's one of the true sort. Why, if I was a fortune teller... Mm, but I'm not. You know what I am, don't you? Good night, Pip. Good night, sir. My dear Mr. Pip, I write this by request of Mr. Gadgery for to let you know that he is going to London in company with Mr. Wopsle and would be glad, if agreeable, to be allowed to see you. He would call at Barnard's Hotel Tuesday morning, nine o'clock, when, if not agreeable, please leave word. Your poor sister is much the same as when you left. We talk of you in the kitchen every night and wonder what you were saying and doing. 
If now considered in the light of a liberty, excuse it for the love of poor old days. No more, dear Mr. Pip, from your ever obliged and affectionate servant, Biddy. Oh, no. P.S. He wishes me most particular to write what larks. He says you will understand. I hope and do not doubt it will be agreeable to see him, even though a gentleman. For you had ever a good heart, and he is a worthy, worthy man. I have read him all, excepting only the last little sentence, and he wishes me most particular to write again. What larks. Let me confess exactly with what feelings I looked forward to Joe's coming. If I could have kept him away by paying money, I certainly would have. I had little objections to his being seen by Herbert or his father, for both of whom I had a respect, but I had the sharpest sensitiveness to his being seen by Drummel, whom I held in contempt. So throughout life, our worst weaknesses and meannesses are usually committed for the sake of people whom we most despise. However, by Tuesday, the sitting room and breakfast table were at their most splendid. Joe! How are you, Joe? Pip! How are you, Pip? I'm glad to see you, Joe. Um, give me your hat. But, holding it in both hands like a bird's nest with eggs in it, he wouldn't. Wish you that growed and that swelled and that gentle folks, as to be sure you're an honour to your king and country. <laughs> and uh, you, Joe, look wonderfully well. Thank God. And your sister, she's no worse than she were. And Biddy, she's ever right and ready. And all friends is no backerer, if not no forwarder, yeah, except in Wopsle. He's had a drop. A drop? He's left the church and went into play acting, which have likewise brought him to London along with me. And his wish were... Getting the bird's nest under his left arm for the moment and groping in it for an egg with his right. I would give you this. The egg I found to be a corrupted playbill announcing the appearance of the celebrated provincial of Russian renown, whose unique performance of Hamlet has lately occasioned so great a sensation in local dramatic circles. W were you at this performance, Joe? I were. Was there a great sensation? Particular when he see the ghost. Though I put it to yourself, sir, whether it were calculated to keep a man up to his work with a good heart, to be all the time cutting in twixt him and the ghost with our men. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Uh, Mr. Herbert Pocket, Mr. Joe Gargery. Your servant, sir. Your servant, sir? Which I hope you two gentlemen got your healths in this close spot. This present spot may be a very good inn according to London opinions, but I wouldn't keep a pig in it myself. Why don't you sit down, Joe? Put your hat on the chimney piece. Do you take tea or coffee, Mr. Gargery? Well, thank you, sir. I'll take whichever is most agreeable to yourself. What do you say to coffee? Thank you, sir. Since you are so kind to make choice of coffee, I'll not run contrary to your opinions. Uh, but don't you never find it a little heated? Say tea, then. Ah. The hat kept toppling from its place. Oops, sorry. Indeed, during his whole stay, it demanded from him a constant attention and a quickness of eye and hand very close to that needed for wicket-keeping. I was heartily glad when Herbert left us for the city. Us two now being alone, sir. Joe, how can you call me sir? Whoops, <laughs> sorry. You, me not having the intentions and abilities to stay many minutes more, I will now conclude what have led to my having had the present honour. I were at the bargeman's the other night, Pip, when there came up in his sherry cart, Pumblechook. Well, Pip, this same identical, which his manners is given to bluster us, Come to me, and his word were, Joseph, Miss Havisham, she wished to speak to you. M Miss Havisham? Go on, please. What? <laughs> Sorry. 
The next day, having cleaned myself, I go. Her expression her then as following. Mr. Gargery, you are in correspondence with Mr. Pip. Having had a letter from you, I were able to say, I am. Would you tell him then that which Estella has come home and would be glad to see him? Oh. Well, I have now concluded, sir. And Pip, I wish you ever well and ever prosper into a greater and greater height. <laughs> Sorry. But you're not going now, Joe. Yes, I am. But you're coming back to dinner. No, I am not. Pip, dear old chap, life is made up of ever so many partings welling together. Divisions among such must come and must be met. You and me is not two figures to be together in London. It ain't that I'm proud, but that I want to be right. As you shall never see me no more in these clothes of this hat, I'm wrong in them. I'm wrong out of the forge, the kitchen, or off the marshes. So. You won't find half so much fault in me if, supposing you should ever wish to see me, you come and put your head in at the forge window and see Joe the blacksmith at the old anvil. I'm awful dull, but I hope I've beat out something nigh on the rights of this at last. And so, God bless you, dear old Pip, old chap. God bless you. The fashion of his dress could no more come in its way when he spoke these words than it could in heaven. He touched me gently on the forehead and went out. As soon as I could recover myself sufficiently, I hurried out after him and looked for him in the neighboring streets, but he was gone. But by the time I had secured my box place by the morning coach, I'd begun to invent reasons why I'd have to stay at the Blue Boar and not with Joe. I'd be an inconvenience. I was not expected. My bed wouldn't be ready. I'd be too far from Miss Havisham's. All other swindlers on earth are nothing to self-deceivers. And with such pretenses did I cheat myself. There are two convicts going down with you. You don't mind, Handel? Oh, no. I can't pretend I like them. But I don't mind them. There they are, coming out of the tap. The great numbers on their backs, as if they were street doors. Their coarse, mangy, ungainly outer surface, as if they were lower animals. Their ironed legs. What a degraded and vile sight. One was taller and stouter than the other. But I knew his half-closed eye. There stood the man I had seen on the settle at the Three Jolly Bargemen one Friday night who had brought me down with his invisible gun. I was not recognised. But for the journey, to accommodate an irate passenger, they sat directly behind me. Their breathing, not only on the back of my head, but all down my spine, was like being touched in the marrow by some pungent and searching acid. The weather was miserably raw. And when we had left the halfway house, we all dozed, shivered, fell silent. I must have napped longer than I'd thought, for I woke with a start. I could trace, even in the darkness, marsh country in the cold, damp wind that blew at us. Cowering forward for warmth and to make me a screen against the wind, the convicts were closer to me than before. How did he get them? Who else should I know? Had them stowed away somehow. Given by friends, I explain. Well, this cold. I wish I had them here. Two one pound notes. Or friends. <laughs> the notes. I'd sell all the friends I ever had for one. And think it a mighty good bargain. <sighs> well, so he says. So he says. It was all said and done in half a minute behind a pile of timber in the dockyard. You are going to be discharged. Yes, I was. Would I find out that boy that had fed him and kept the secret and give him them two one-pound notes? Yes, I would. And I you did. more fool, you. What a spent one wickles and drink. Oh, it must have been a green one, him. I mean to say he know nothing of you. Not a hapeth. Different gangs. 
different ships. He was tried again for prison breaking and got made a lifer. The coincidence of our being together on the coach was sufficient to fill me with the dread of me being recognised. So, at the first lamp, on the first stones of the town, I jumped down, leaving the convicts to be spirited off to the river, while I made for the Blue Boar free. Orly. Come in. You suppose to my orders to keep this gate open? Yes. Here I am. How did you come here? On my legs. I had my box brought alongside me in a barrow. Then you have left the forge. Does this look like a forge? How long since you left? One day, so like another year, I don't know, without casting it up. However, I come here some time since you left. I could have told you that. Ah, but then you've got to be a scholar. I never saw this room before. Nor did no one till it got about that there was no protection on the premises. With convicts and tag and rag and bobtail going up and down. And then I was recommended as a man who could give another man as good as he brought. And I took it. It's easier than bellows in and hammering. That's loaded, that is. My eye had been caught by a gun with a brass bound stock over the chimney piece. Well, shall I go up to Miss Havisham? Burn me if I know. My orders ends here, young master. I give this here bell a rap with this here hammer. And you go on along. You know your way, sir. Come in, Pip. She was in her chair near the old table, with her two hands crossed on her stick, her chin resting on them, and her eyes on the fire. Sitting near her, with the white shoe that had never been worn in her hand, and her head bent as she looked at it, was an elegant lady whom I had never seen. How do you do, Pip? Ah. So you kiss my hand as if I were a queen. Well? Well? I heard, Miss Havisham, that you were so kind as to wish me to come and see you. And I came directly. Pip? The woman was Estella. Even more beautiful. So beautiful, the old sense of her inaccessibility and our difference flooded over me. I, I, I'm so pleased to see you again. Do you find her much changed, Pip? It's been a long time. Sit down. When I came in, Miss Havisham, I thought there was nothing of Estella in the face or figure. But now it all settles down so curiously into the old... The old Estella? She was proud and insulting and you wanted to go away from her. Don't you remember? That, that was a long time ago. I, I knew no better. Is he changed? Very much. Less coarse and common? <laughs> Take him into the garden. Tell him, my darling, all about France and you going to London. Go. Walk in the garden. Then, Pip, come back and you shall wheel me as you used to. Go. This is where you had your fight. Yes. 
I must have been a singular little creature to hide and see the fight that day. But I did. And I enjoyed it very much. You rewarded me very much. Did I? With a kiss. I remember I entertained a great objection to your adversary because I took it ill that he should be brought here to pester me with his company. He and I are great friends now. You had no idea of your impending good fortune in those times? Not the least. Do you remember you made me cry? Did I? I don't. You must know that I have no heart, if that has anything to do with my memory. Permit me to doubt that. Oh, I have a heart to be stabbed in or shot in, I have no doubt. And, of course, if it ceased to beat, I should cease to be. But you know what I mean. I have no softness there, no sympathy, sentiment, nonsense. I am serious. If we are to be thrown much together, you had better believe it at once. Perhaps there is... No. I haven't bestowed my tenderness elsewhere. I have never had any such thing. What's the matter? Are you scared again? I should be, if I believed what you said. It said... Now she's gone to make herself even more beautiful. Do you admire her? Anybody who sees her must, Miss Havisham. If she favours you, love her. If she wounds you, love her. If she tears your heart to pieces, and as it gets older and stronger it will tear deeper, love her, love her, love her. Hear me, Pip. I adopted her to be loved. I bred her and educated her to be loved. I developed her into what she is, that she might be loved. Love her. I'll tell you what real love is. It's blind devotion, unquestioning, self-humiliation, utter submission. Trust and belief against yourself and against the whole world, giving up your whole heart and soul to the smiter as I did. Ah... Punctual as ever. As ever. Shall I give you a ride, Miss Havisham? Once round? Well, Pip, have you often seen Miss Estella before? Indeed. How often? Hmm? Ten thousand times? Oh, certainly not so many. Oh, twice? Jaggers, leave my Pip alone and go with him to your dinner. <laughs> go, go, go. After dinner, we played at whist. Miss Havisham, having put some of the most beautiful jewels from her dressing table into Estella's hair and about her bosom and arms, her sheer loveliness was before us. After it had been arranged I should meet her off the coach when she came to London, I took leave of Estella and touched her and left. Estella's name, mm. is it Havisham or... Or what? Is it Havisham? It is Havisham. I doubt Mr. Jaggers Orlick to be the right sort of man to fill a position of trust. Well, of course he isn't, Pip, because the man who fills a post of trust never is the right sort of man. I believe Orlick is dangerous. Very good. I shall go round tomorrow and pay our friend off. And uh, violent. He'll be difficult to deal with. Oh, no, he won't. I should like to see him argue the question with me. If London can't, he won't. In episode three of Great Expectations... Pip was played by Douglas Hodge, Miss Havisham by Geraldine McEwen, 
and Estella by Amanda Redman. John Shrapnel was Jaggers, Timothy Bateson, Wemmick, James Simmons, Herbert Pocket, and Michael Turner, the aged P. Joe Gargery was played by Jim Carter, Biddy by Emma Gregory, Orlick by Brian Hewlett, Bentley Drummell by Alan Barker, and The First Convict by Fraser Carr. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The music was composed by Malcolm Clark. Great Expectations was dramatised by Ray Jenkins and directed by Sally Avons. <laughs>